Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the World Economic Forum annual meeting, and specifically to this session towards a global treaty on plastic pollution. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and also virtually. My name is Jessica Chiam. I'm founder and managing director of sustainability media platform, Eco Business, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this session. Allow me a moment to set the context. Earlier in March this year, heads of state and other representatives at the United Nations Environment Assembly made history in Nairobi by adopting a resolution setting a path to a legally binding global treaty to end plastic pollution. We've all known for a while that we are in a plastics crisis. From our fish to our oceans and even in our blood streams, plastic pollution is a defining problem of our era. It is a global scourge that is entirely of our own making, but it's also entirely within our power to solve. This global treaty aims to address the full life cycle of plastics, including its production, design, and disposal. And in the next two years of negotiations until 2024, it will be decisive for the scope and impact that this instrument can have on the world's plastic pollution crisis. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panel of speakers who are key stakeholders shaping this global agreement. They will discuss what this treaty means for different countries, for industry and civil society, what insights they can offer to inform the design of an effective instrument, and what needs to be included or not included to make this global treaty truly game-changing. And I'd now like to introduce them. We have for our opening remarks, Marco Lambertini, Director General of WWF. And then we have Gustavo Manrique Miranda, Minister of Environment and Water of Ecuador. And we have Leah Vemelin, Minister of Environment, Denmark. And we have Joshua Amponsem, Founder, Green Africa Youth Organization from Ghana, as well as Laurent Fraxet, Lauren Frex, <laughs> testing my French, Executive Vice President and CEO, Zone Latin America of Nestle. Later to close this session, we will also hear from Minister Espen Barth Eide, Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway. Espen is also the UNEA President and played a key role in the treaty process at UNEA earlier this year. So for now, to start us off, I'd like to invite Marco to share his opening remarks. WWF has been instrumental in leading the efforts towards a legally binding international treaty on plastic pollution and also actively engaging the private sector. Marco, the floor is yours. Jessica, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for the kind uh, words of introduction. Let me just by uh, starting by um, reflecting on the extraordinary journey of the perception of plastic pollution over the last few years, where the whole thing started with a, an aesthetic concern and landed into a major environmental and social concern. Uh, you mentioned this in your introduction, Jessica. Uh, plastic, plastic pollution is today a major defining environmental issue, but more than that, it is an issue that is beginning to actually affect the health of ecosystems that in turn affect the stability of our economy, our society, our livelihoods. The latest disturbing uh, discovery that as plastic breaks down in smaller and smaller particles, microplastic first entering the food chain, so ends up in our food, uh, and, and it goes even smaller into nanoplastic level, uh, there is now evidence that the plastic can actually cross the uh, human cells, or even the brain membrane, and uh, the effect is still unclear, but surely doesn't look like very promising. So it's a major concern, and it is uh, potentially getting worse, because uh, we are producing uh, 300 over 300 million metric tons of plastic per year, uh, about 100 over 100 million those tons go straight into the environment and slowly make their way into the ocean, polluting land first and then rivers and then the ocean, but l even reaching the air that we breathe. And so we're beginning to really be exposed in so many different ways to this uh, uh, type of pollution. There's some exciting developments though. First of all, we've seen over the years some uh, really courageous uh, uh, actions taken uh, voluntarily by governments, by uh, cities, mayors, by companies, in terms of reducing, mitigating the impact uh, of plastic on the environment, reducing plastic pollution. There's been bans of various types, there have been restrictions, taxes, uh, all this absolutely uh, uh, to welcome, very encouraging, 
but clearly, clearly not enough. And so the issue has gone worse uh, year after year, and we know that plastic uh, production and consumption will double by 2040, triple by 2050 if we don't intervene now, and with it, plastic pollution as well. So the most encouraging thing, of course, happened just a couple of months ago um, in uh, uh, Nairobi, where, as you mentioned, governments finally, supported by civil society calls and by companies, uh, a request for some clear directions on how to deal with plastic pollution, have agreed to start the negotiations. Let's be clear, start the negotiation <laughs> of, of a new historic, potentially historic, uh, UN plastic pollution treaty. That's something we all welcome, but let's be honest, the hard part starts now. And uh, in a, next month, uh, the negotiation will actually officially start. And this is where we need to uh, engage the whole of society, government, businesses, investors, consumers, to make sure that the treaty that comes out of these negotiations is fit for purpose to deal with such a global issue, although local in nature, global issue like plastic pollution. Our uh, four must-have of the treaty start from a very clear uh, global goal uh, for the treaty itself. We need a global goal that is inspirational, but also measurable. And uh, the way it has been framed until now for us is very good. It's basically end plastic pollution. End plastic pollution. That has to be the purpose of the, of the treaty. Uh, then, in order to achieve that goal, if you set the bar so high, um, uh, we have to take a holistic approach. The uh, plastic value chain is very complex. Um, the interactions uh, in the environment are complex as well. The various players engage or scattered across society at different levels, so we need a holistic approach. And by holistic approach, it's an approach that takes care of the full life cycle of plastic from production, upstream, down to uh, consumption, waste management, and, uh, 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 and recycling. Uh, uh, and that's important. And there is not going to be one silver bullet. We need to take several approaches integrated in one uh, consistent plan. And let me uh, uh, stress uh, perhaps the most controversial dimension of all this discussion we expect to be, which is the upstream part. I think everybody agrees that we need to invest more in uh, uh, recycling, in infrastructure to uh, uh, recycle in collection and waste management across the world. But we also need, and we need this treaty, to set some clear targets for reduction. There is a lot of avoidable plastic, a lot of unnecessary plastic, a lot of problematic, dangerous plastic that is today produced that shouldn't be produced in the future. Uh, and that includes uh, banning, includes uh, regulating with clear global standards the design of products, the way uh, in which plastic is, is disposed uh, and, uh, and uh, managed as waste to avoid that becomes pollution. Uh, and finally, um, uh, I think we think the very important dimension of um, uh, financial mechanisms as well as regulatory incentives to make sure that there are uh, investments in the direction of an ending of plastic pollution uh, global goal. Uh, and that's in any agreement that I've been part of, uh, from biodiversity to climate, now plastic, is going to be a very delicate but very important dimension. If the financial uh, flows uh, that today are heavily investing in producing plastic and not enough in uh, uh, finding solution to prevent plastic to become a pollutant, uh, if, we, if financial flows are not moving in the, in the other direction in order to find, fund the solutions to uh, uh, ending plastic solution, we won't, we, won't, uh, uh, we won't have a treaty that works. So, um, Jessica, this is my initial remarks. I think we are all extremely excited about where we are, great momentum, but more than ever, we need now to pull rank governments, businesses, civil society, consumers, and really make sure that this treaty is fit for purpose. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to the discussion of the panel. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marco, for so eloquently giving us that overview and to remind us that we need clear targets for reduction as well as global standards, as well as the importance of financial flows. Um, Minister Gustavo, I'm going to start off with you. Your country has been huge champions of a legally binding treaty and Ecuador has also submitted a candidacy to chair the Bureau of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee that's been entrusted with preparing this treaty. How has the country been impacted by plastic pollution and what difference would this treaty make? Can we get your views? Thanks, uh, Jessica. I want to start once again uh, congratulating Spain for the leadership. That was a really an accomplishment. I was there in Kenya and it, it was amazing. And a second thing that I want to congratulate is Nestlé. I was part of an event in Ecuador. Nestlé chose Ecuador to become one of the pilot projects to uh, have uh, full neutrality in plastic and they accomplish, actually, they are recycling more plastic than what they put in the street. So uh, congratulations, thanks for, for choosing and trusting in, in, in Ecuador, Loren. Uh, you know, I always, Jessica, that have this opportunity in order to, to share what Ecuador has done, I, I always bring Galapagos to the table because I, I think that all of us related a, a little bit with Galapagos. It, it's in your heart. Uh, it remembers Charles Darwin, all these species. Uh, it's 97% national park. Uh, we have preserved 95% of all endemic species. And, and what does, does that have to, to, to do with this issue is that, uh, yes, Ecuador have been moving very uh, straightforward in, in regulation. We, uh, Guayaquil, which is one of the biggest cities, uh, we have a prohibition and regulation for single-use plastic uh, in all plastics. Um, it, it, it's banned, it's prohibited several years ago. Uh, after Guayaquil came a lot, uh, some other cities like Quito, uh, some uh, cities from Manabí. Uh, after that, those, those were local uh, regulations. And after that came the assembly, the Congress, and we have a single-use plastic national law. Um, one year ago, exactly in, in July, uh, June, July, um, we approved as a, as a country, as well as circular economy law. And in Galapagos, we have, so many years ago, fully banned, obviously, plastic. But even those, those efforts, Jessica, um, we pick from our oceanic coast at Galapagos, 83% of the plastic that we pick comes from other continents. 83% come from other countries, continents. 17% come from Ecuadorian continent, and only 1% it's the plastic that it's in Galapagos. I mean, even though it's banned, you always have some. So uh, I can't find a better example for the phrase that we all have local problems that need global solutions. So I, I think in a practical way, that's, that's the best example, Jessica, I can share with you that it doesn't matter the efforts we do. Um, if we don't get to the UNEA agreement, uh, historic UNEA agreement, we won't find a solution. And I'm not going to go through what plastic does, the volume, and because you all know better than I that. But I wanted to share that uh, um, experience from Ecuador. Thank you for that very local experience as well as the political leadership for enacting laws on circular economy and single-use plastic. I think that's very progressive and there are many countries that are still behind on that. Um, thank you for that. Um, Minister Leia, I'd like to come to you because Denmark is obviously one of the earliest supporters of this global treaty, um, driving the 2019 Nordic Declaration on Plastics. How will Denmark continue supporting the development of this treaty and how do you think this piece of legislation can help to scale some of the circular economy solutions we're seeing in the plastics industry? Well, I can truly echo that what we need is global regulation. And so that was why Denmark joined uh, a push for an ambitious global regulation uh, and the work starts now. I agree on, on that. So we really need to keep that momentum from the UNEA 5 in Nairobi, which was a historic move towards ending plastic pollution. 
but now we need to show civil society, our populations, that we can come together as a world and actually uh, find those political solutions that are necessary because each and every country cannot solve this problem alone. So what we want and what we push for from the Danish side together with my Nordic colleagues is an ambitious uh, global treaty where we look at the entire life cycle of plastics. So not only on the waste streams, how do we reuse and recycle, but also how do we design, how do we get rid of all that unnecessary plastic, single-use plastic that we know already today we can never use again. Uh, and so uh, that is a systemic change that we want and that we need in order to tackle one of these planetary crises that I think we all recognize that we're in the middle of. Uh, and so my last point would be that we also need the alliance with the industry because we can regulate and uh, we are willing to do that and come together as, uh, uh, as um, uh, countries. But we also need uh, companies to do pilots to be in the front uh, of designing products that doesn't have the same environmental and climate impact that we see today. Thank you for that. And reminding us also of the planetary crisis that we're seeing. And I think the United Nations Environment Programme has been articulating this triple planetary crisis of climate pollution and nature. And plastics is so intertwined with all three. So really, thank you for those insights. Um, Joshua, I'd like to come to you now. Uh, the Green Africa Youth Organization is leading diverse community projects addressing the issue of plastic pollution in Africa. How will this global treaty support efforts such as your organizations? Thank you very much, and uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, in Nairobi, one thing that was already very clear was the opportunity for stakeholders who were not previously recognized to be recognized as part of this treaty. Even though the negotiation is yet to be started, already we've seen informal waste workers clearly being identified as a clear stakeholder, and that makes our work way more easier. For many emerging economies across Sub-Saharan Africa and many places I've been, it's not the former companies that are collecting waste. They are not the ones cleaning up the city. It's the informal waste workers that clean up the city. If we miss that opportunity of making them part of the development of this treaty, it's not going to work. So for me, that is a very clear opportunity that in Nairobi, we already saw that. We saw certain governments already even pledging support on mobilizing to support strengthening the capacity of informal waste workers. And what that makes it easier for civil society is that we are able to then strengthen the capacity of informal waste workers locally, increase collection rates, facilitate education, because they are the ones who go to the homes every day to collect waste. And they can really facilitate education, whether it's separation, segregation, reduction. They are the ones who can make the change happen as fast as possible. And this treaty is something that we're hoping and counting on the support, not just financially, but also politically, to make sure that regulations are facilitating and making sure that waste workers, whether formal or informal, have an equal status in terms of access to resources to be able to operate. And that is how we think that as civil society, we can make the change happen very fast. Thank you for that. I think the key role of civil society is very clear here and you know it plays such a huge um, aspect of uh, engaging local communities to solve this issue. Um, I think it's very timely now to then bring in the business perspective and Laurent, I mean Nestle has been um, doing a lot of work in this area and is also one of the hundred global companies that express strong support um, by signing a business manifesto urging UN member states to adopt this treaty. So from the Nestle perspective, why are you supportive of this global treaty and and um, what concrete opportunities do you see coming out of it? Um, very important question, of course. And uh, well, first and foremost, we believe in a waste-free future. Resources are finite, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, nothing, none of our packaging, for instance, ends up in landfill, and that we contribute to solve uh, this massive issue, which is one third of the food produced uh, gets to waste which is a shame uh, in a context where one billion of people are starving on the planet. So they are, they are, th those are massive issues. Uh, we believe we should think circular. We should not think linear. We believe we should stop talking about end of life of the product. There should be no end of life. And that goes from design to manufacturing to 
distributing, to consuming, to collecting, to recycling, to reusing. Uh, and, um, and, and we believe uh, in, uh, in a virt virtuous circle in this respect, uh, so uh, this is very, very embedded uh, in, uh, in our vision. Uh, so we are, we are committed, of course, to uh, stop uh, and, um, and uh, we are, co are very engaged to stop uh, plastic pollution. It is a global issue, it's been said, um, it's, it's mind-blowing to see the impact uh, in the Galap Galapagos of the of the global, uh, global packaging uh, pollution. Um, it requires a global effort. It has to be collaborative and collective, uh, all stakeholders playing their part, and we are committed, of course, to play our part. We understand our role, um, including in, in designing and in innovating. You mentioned that we uh, build up uh, um, an innovation center for packaging. Uh, mobilizing resources to design novel packagings and uh, making sure that uh, we uh, integrate all the dimensions uh, that uh, will be fit uh, for the future that we, we dream of. So uh, back to the question, uh, why, why are we committed? Because we see a proliferation of initiatives, which is good and bad. So it's good because it shows uh, concern and interest. It's bad because it kind of spreads in the resources. Uh, we see a proliferation of regulations, uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> it's good because it shows that uh, there is willingness to make an impact, create a level playing field, but it's bad because, again, it spreads uh, resources seen. And uh, so we, we really call for this uh, global uh, uh, plastic treaty uh, for that matter because it should help channel resources uh, design the policies that uh, uh, should help resolve that global issue, not in a dispersed way, but uh, in a collective and collaborative way. So we are extremely supportive for that matter. Thank you for those perspectives. I want to deep dive into the global agreement a little because we've seen um, you know, a few different types of texts emerge from there, some more comprehensive addressing the entire life cycle, some more focused on the end of the life cycle. What should and should not be included in this agreement? Maybe I get the ministers for your views first. Well, if uh, I should start, I would say we need the whole life cycle approach because we cannot end plastic pollution if we still uh, find plastics out in our environment and plastics that cannot be reused or recycled. But we also need to look at the whole value chain here, as it was said from Nestle as well, because if we don't find other ways of uh, producing and uh, finding new ways to not use the single plastics that we cannot deal with today that end up in uh, nature, then we won't solve the problem. And I think uh, people were so inspired when we were in Nairobi. I mean, people were crying, we were so happy, it was tears of joy, and, and we all felt so optimistic. And I think that sense of the whole globe coming together to tackle such a global issue also means that young people, civil society are putting faith into policy makers. And we really need to show them that it's possible. And so we can't stop just by taking one step looking at the waste streams. We have to look at how we can reduce how much plastic we're going to use and how we can reduce our consumption climate footprint. So for at least for, for, for Denmark, we will, we will work for, uh, for the whole life cycle approach. Thank you for sharing that. I really love that sentiment of putting faith in policy making. Um, and a related question I have really is how much teeth do you think this global treaty will have? Because if you compare it to the, the Paris Climate Agreement, um, a lot of the action is voluntary and it's still struggling to get nation member states to comply with the targets that they've set. So maybe Minister Gustavo, you can offer some opinion on that. Yes, um, I, I come from the private sector, so this is my first time working in a global agreement. So I don't know how many details you can dig in and what in the practical way you can write in the global agreement, but uh, let me share my opinion from, again, from the experience and the practical things we have implemented in, in Ecuador. And I, I think there is a very big difference be, be, uh, between the Paris Agreement and, and Kenya Agreement. or. It, it is that this one 
it's a lot more tangible. You open a fish and you find plastic. The, so, so we have to act now as, as, as uh, firemen, you know, when, when you act when a house is in fire. It, the climate change is a, a little bit, you know, it's not tangible. So uh, we, we can really go into, into practical things and measure and KPIs and all that. Um, I want to share a couple of things in, in one thought. A couple of things that we have done in Ecuador, and, and it really has worked out really well. We are one of the uh, best countries in recycling plastic pet per capita in the world. And how we, we, we did that? Uh, we tax with a redeemable um, tax of two cents per bottle. So we give a, pri a, a, a cost for the bottle. We are a developing country. In, in, in Ecuador, you can still have a lunch with two dollars. So if you raise two dollars, you can have a lunch in a decent place. So if, if, if the kilo of the plastic bottle is in 10 cents, okay, you, you, you can, you can uh, raise 100 kilos and, and, and have a lunch. So it's an opportunity. Um, I, I challenge you to go to Ecuador and walk the streets. You won't find any plastic bottle in the street, but how, this is the unique thing of how it is working in Ecuador. The importer, and Christine, you will have to listen to this once again. You, the importer of the resign puts in an endowment of the IRS, the, you say IRS? Tax. The tax house of uh, uh, Ecuador, the two cents per bottle. Then, when, when, when this importer of the resign is going to sell to the factory that it's going to fabric the bottle, this one pays for the resign and the two cents. Then, when to the bottle it, it's going to sell the bottle. This one pay the two cents plus the bottle, and then the retailer sells the liquid, the bottle, and the two cents. So at the end, the final consumer has two cents in the hand. And there are official places where you can go all over around Ecuador, and you leave the bottle, mm -hmm. and they gave you two cents, and the picker keeps the paper. Mm -hmm. and the bottle, and he can go to the government and redeem the two cents, and then he can sell the bottle. So with that in mind, we, we create a $50 million business that it's in the base of the pyramid now, in the more poorest, and that's more or less $210 per month for them, um, and 70% are women that, that carry over the back one ton. I don't know if if I have, I have more time or oh, okay. Joshua, if it's the, okay. The closing I will because show. I, I like the example you used about putting a, a value on on plastics and waste. And I want to bring Joshua in because you mentioned earlier that we need political leadership and we need finance. So what are you hoping to see out of this global treaty from the finance perspective, and how would that help support civic society? Yeah, uh, great. I mean, fantastic example for me, um, and and it works, right? If I look at it from a global perspective, what the treaty should do is not put so much hope in the recycling sector, because it's not going to work at a global perspective. It's not going to happen. If it would work, it would have worked by now, because we've had a lot of recycling initiatives all along. So what I think that a majority of the investment should go into reduction and reuse, sort of the basic concept of life and how we've been living all along, reuse and reduction. So less virgin materials, reuse what is already there, and just prevent, particularly the single-use plastics, they have to go out. Now, the next step, which is a lesson from the climate argument, is we had the Paris Agreement, we had mitigation and adaptation, then we had finance, which was promised, but a lot of that went into mitigation, not adaptation. So I could also see the risk of the treaty focusing so much on reduction, 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 but then there's already enough plastics out there which we need to clean up. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't go away, it's not any of us in this room who's going to suffer. It's going to be the very marginalized people living by the coastal areas, living by rivers, who are going to suffer. So the treaty should have a very fair, decent amount of share that goes into cleaning up, getting all the stuff that are already in there out, protecting communities who are heavily affected by that, but significantly reduction, reduce. Particularly the production phase, additives that makes it super difficult to recycle. 
So at the engineering and the design phase, and Leslie and all other fast moving consumer goods from the industry as a whole, need to invest a lot into the packaging sector such that whatever comes out, if at the early stages we still have to do a lot in recycling, it should be something that is easily recyclable. Then the other part, which I think is also very important, is that we cannot just look at it from a plastic perspective. There are other sort of waste that exist, which makes it extremely difficult to work with plastics, and that is organic waste. In many, I mean, in Ghana, for instance, and across Sub-Saharan Africa, 65% of waste is still organic waste. If you do not tackle that, and that get mixed up with the plastics, you might have a brilliant initiative to get plastics out, but because they are mixed up with organics, you cannot deal with it. It becomes extremely difficult. So there we need to build allies with our informal sector, with the waste workers, and we need to build allies with homes and citizens, and give an infrastructure and a system that allows to deal with organic waste so that we can also help manage the plastic waste. And that is what I'm hoping for. Now the last thing which I think should be integrated into the whole treaty is fair share, equity, and justice. And this should be a basic principle for all the crises we're dealing with now, because someone caused it. Someone is responsible. And even though we have a common problem, we should have differentiated responsibilities. And in that sense, I see a significant role for certain countries to have a much bigger leadership financing and really taking the step practically, policy-wise, finance-wise, to be able to cause a, cause a movement that allows that to happen. Tomorrow, May 25th, uh, across the African continent, together with our allies, we are celebrating something called Africa Day. And what we are fighting is waste colonizing, uh, colonization. Shipping waste into Africa, e-waste, mm -hmm. fabrics, someone has to be responsible. I don't know that if you have a treaty that doesn't recognize the fact how the waste ended there and says, okay, we're gonna reduce or we're gonna recycle, that is not right. Because at the end of the day, like climate crisis, the typhoon, the floods, others live comfortably and others live in panic. And that shouldn't happen with the plastics treaty. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Great. Super powerful. Thank you, Joshua. I think you've raised some very good points on there. And I want to pick up on two points. One, you mentioned a cap on plastic, and then you mentioned differentiated responsibilities. I just wondered, what are the perspectives here on putting legislation on it? Because I, there's already you know, a pushback from the plastics manufacturing lobby, for example, not wanting to cap how much plastic that they can produce. Business perspective, perhaps, Lauren? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not from that side, but uh, <laughs> we believe that, uh, yes, indeed, less packaging uh, is, is important. Uh, so, uh, and, and obviously, less virgin plastic is of the essence. Uh, better packaging, better systems. Uh, so the reduce, reuse, uh, recycle uh, should be uh, center stage uh, in, those, uh, in this treaty. Uh, it's important to uh, support uh, investments in innovation. We need the novel packagings, of course, and the novel solutions. Uh, I do believe that investing in uh, infrastructure is still critical. Uh, so maybe you should not expect uh, all from uh, recycling, but uh, I do believe that this is part of the solution. And you know, we, we have committed to make 100% uh, of our packaging reusable and recyclable by 2025. But if we don't see the infrastructures in place, uh, one way or another, uh, will be very difficult to, to make sure that we get this uh, circular uh, system that uh, we would like to see in place. And then um, I, I absolutely agree with what you said in, in, in the sense of uh, uh, we need smart uh, regulation, uh, regulation that takes in, into account uh, intended consequences and unintended consequences as well. I think it's really important to look at the job size, for instance, really important to look at SMEs, uh, how will, we, will they be impacted by uh, those uh, policies and look at the broader sustainability uh, agenda. Uh, it will not be easy, it's a big task that, uh, that you got, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's a one in a generation, once in a generation opportunity, and let's make sure that we get it right, you, you can count on our support. And uh, I'm not speaking only on, on Lesses behalf, I know that uh, many companies are, are really on board. Thank you. Ministers, any views on the cap on plastic or the polluters pay principle? Well, I think the polluter pay principle has been at the core of environmental policies for so many years, and it's a good principle. So we should build our environmental policies on that. And so the same goes for this global treaty. And of course, we 
need to tackle exactly what is being said on reducing because as we started off with the numbers, the doubling of plastics in 2040, the tripling of plastics in 2050, if we don't act, even if we make fantastic systems that can recycle a lot, I think we all know that that amount of plastic is impossible to handle uh, and we won't have the right infrastructure to tackle it in all countries. So I think what we really need is that systemic change. And <clears throat> of course, it's linked to finance. Of course, it links to, to, uh, to being strict on, on regulation. And I think we should be bold here and show that it is manageable, uh, as my colleague uh, said uh, earlier before. Of course, it's difficult, and now we're still in the early days of negotiating. I think we will also feel the resistance. <coughs> uh, we need to show that we can be bold. We've been looking at this problem evolving throughout the years, but now our, our uh, uh, public in, in all of the countries are saying to us, enough is enough. It's visible. We need you to act, and, and we need to act now. And so I think there's reason to be hopeful, but it's going to take, uh, take that collaboration that we see here. Do you want to add? Yes, a um, couple small things. Um, just um, Joshua and Loren said, the three R's that we have the impronta in our heads and, and all the kids. But uh, I think that, that uh, we should invest in conscious and we should work more in the four R, which is refuse. Oh. Because if we don't buy the problem, there is nothing to solve. For example, th this organization, the WEF, decide to refuse the plastic and they went glass. So, if we work more harder in the R of refuse, the problem will be smaller. That, that, that's one thing. And, and the other one, again, going in, in the binding laws and the global treatment or agreement, um, I think there are national laws, uh, binding laws in different countries that are really working in human health. For example, United States, it is mandatory that all the menus uh, that they sell in a table or it's an ice cream or whatever, you me they measure the calories. So you have the option to, ha to eat a fried fish with 1,000 calories or a steamed fish with 200. But what is looking, the government, is to reduce the cost of health, of, 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 of taking charge of that. And, and there are plenty in Ecuador, we have the traffic light for sodium, fat, and salt. And it has completely changed the culture of the country. My kids, they look around the, 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 the can and see the traffic light. But everything of that is looking human health. I think that agreement should look for planet health. So this is an idea that the first time I heard it, I heard it from Gonzalo Munoz that is joining us here, champion from COP, uh, that we should work in a recyclable index so the bottle, or anything, should have one number here based in a percentage of what recycled material was made from, what purchase can be recycled, and the caloric capacity. So that's a 100% or 85. So if you're the consumer and, and you go here, besides the sodium or the calories, you know, you, you know, you take care of the, of the planet health. So those kind of things, practical things that will change the culture, culture worldwide, I think that uh, that's the challenge for the agreement. Thank you so much. I really love the practical idea of the fourth R as well as the recyclable index. Uh, with an eye on the time, I think I'd like to wrap up this discussion by a quick fire round you know, with uh, the panelists. In one word, what is the hope that you have for this global treaty? Perhaps I start with Laura. Thank you. <laughs> and maybe one, one word on, on education, transparency, information, education, very critical. And the hope is that we get a quick treaty in place. Uh, we have no time. Uh, we got commitments uh, and, and we want to end uh, plastic pollution. It's now. Uh, so please, Thank be quick. Thank you. Joshua? I think what I'll say is that we have enough pilot solutions of what works. We need to scale. So there is, 
like you said, there are brilliant ideas here and there. They are being piloted here and there, small scale, small community there. We need to scale that globally, national level, internationally, and make it work. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Well, my hope is that if we have the three planetary crises, climate, biodiversity, and plastic pollution, what should be most easy to solve is the plastic pollution. So let's show that it's actually possible to give hope that we can solve the two other crises as well. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, if uh, here's an engineer, uh, he will say that typically to solve a problem in a value chain, the solution is in the beginning of the chain. So I think we should work, again, more in conscious and awareness. Because if we work in the uh, 4R, uh, we won't have the problem. So I, I really trust that something that works in now, I mean, you take care of what you love. So if you don't understand the problem, you, you won't act. So for me, it's, it's awareness, conscious, Thank you very much. And if I could just sum it up, I think what we hope for for this global treaty really is speed, teeth, scale, solutions, and consciousness. And I think, you know, on that note, I would love to wrap up this session and also then invite um, the Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway, Espen Barth Ide, to come and close this session for us. Minister, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was a really, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I think this was a very rich session on a super important and, and, um, and inspiring topic. It was, uh, as uh, Lea said, it was a very emotional moment when we finally agreed 175 countries after a lot of long nights and hard discussions over months and weeks and the final days all into the night. But we managed to get a mandate which was actually more ambitious than most of us had hoped for, uh, had, had dared to hope for. We hoped for it, but we didn't really think. It, <laughs> it's source to see. It's source to see. It's a whole value chain. Uh, it is, so it's legally binding. We will have national action plans. It's a, it's a very solid mandate. And the negotiations on the details of the treaty, because this is still to be negotiated, right? But, but the outer framework is there in the mandate. And that's something we, all of us, you know, the, the, the civil, civil society, businesses, governments need to remind each other about. You, you can negotiate inside the scope of the mandate, but you cannot sort of forget what the mandate tells you. So that's super important. And I think your summing up was very good. I, I, first, I think I'm very glad Yosha mentioned the importance of bringing uh, a just transition to this. I mean, there, there was actually, a shocking, to me at least, number of 20 million people uh, living from waste picking. Of course, that's an estimate, but it's probably a quite good estimate all around the world. And these people are actually, you know, there are some examples of picking plastics and bringing them to recycling facilities and so on. But you need to involve those. That's incredibly important that these are involved in the process. Um, it's incredibly important that we learn from each other, you know, that. Um, that uh, governments share experiences. Uh, there's no purpose in inventing the wheel over and over again. Uh, yes, countries have different starting points, but there's also a lot of regulatory regimes developed that can be copied and adapted rather than invented anew. And yes, at times you'll need money, but much of what the governments needs to do is not about money. It's actually, you can actually bring money into the economy rather than spending, because you can put, for instance, fees on, um, on uh, virgin plastic on the first use. You can, you can give some benefits uh, uh, in, the, in the system, in the circular economy to the preference for recycled plastic. I, by the way, I very much agree we you first need to reduce. And the first thing you, we need to do is to make sure we don't use plastic where we don't need to, right? So, so and, and banning single use is not costly. I mean, it's costly for some, someone, but not for the government. So remember that. But, but then I want to say in this forum, we're not against polymers. We're going to build a lot of things. We're building I mean, furniture and cars and, and a lot of practical things from plastic. That's not the problem. The problem, and we'll continue to do that, in, in many cases, plastics is better than some of the alternatives. What you need to do is to end the waste. Yeah. And then it is to do the best you can on reduce, reuse, and recycle. And you need to have sort of a proper, uh, you know, calculation. Not reusing is often good, but not always good. Sometimes, I mean, I don't want to 
when I take my COVID test, I'm very glad it hasn't been used before. And there's certain things it's really, it's really good that it's single use, but you can still recycle it, right? Yeah. So, so uh, I, you also want to know what, what's in, uh, you know, what's in the plastic, what kind of chemicals have you associated with the plastic, because you don't want to recycle hazardous uh, substances, right? So I think echo design, design for long use and then uh, recycling, uh, put certain standards on what we think is acceptable type of polymers, acceptable uh, plastics, um, share experiences on how you can use less, how you can reuse, how you can recycle, how you have collection systems that actually work, adapted to country circumstances. How do you make sure it is beneficial to actors in the economy to actually recycle? And here regulators can help a lot. And I want to say, I mean, we very much cherish the work of the WWF and, uh, and some other key, important, very inspirational uh, civil society actors, but also the business sector. A lot of people in the business sector actually spoke up to say we want regulation. We, we want to do the right thing. Help us to define that for the entire marketplace. We don't want to be alone doing this. We want the others to bring the others along to, ca to come up with the standards. And my final point, uh, apart from thanking everyone for a great session, is that this can be done. And it's really important to tell people it's very hard. I mean, it's a, it's a big, I've been visiting some of these uh, dumps. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of plastic out there, to put it that way. And we're seeing it in, uh, you know, Norwegian research states and at the Antarctica and on Ar in the Arctic and so on. Everywhere, I found it in my own blood. So the problem is really, really big, but it can be done. It's a man-made problem, 100%. And since it's man-made, we can also, men and women can also solve it. And I think, uh, I think what both my Nordic sister Lea said and also my, my Ecuadorian brother, you know, uh, uh, Gustavo, is that we need to have some of these tangible things in the environmental climate area where, which is concrete enough that people actually can see that it's getting better on the way. And in that spirit, I think we should work very well together, all of us, between governments, uh, civil society and the business sector to keep up the good work from Nairobi in order to get the treaty. And my very last point is two years, <laughs> two years, I'm, an, I'm a former Foreign Minister, two years in diplomacy is like two seconds for normal people. It's very, very short time, but that was done on purpose. We really wanted to use the momentum, and we committed ourselves to conclude and adopt the treaty in 2024, and then there's no time to lose. So thank you, World Economic Forum, for keeping such a strong focus on this important uh, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.